talk in general about dreams and visions. Because the Lord has spoken through dreams and visions in the past over us as individuals at times and over our church and over our city. And a bunch of those words are back there on our promise wall. I just added a couple of new ones. So if you haven't been there uh, in a while, definitely go and check those out. That's why they're back there. Um, and so I, I really feel like just bringing a little bit of clarity, a little bit of definition, because you may be saying, well, I'm not sure about this prophetic stuff. I'm not sure about dreams and visions. And I know it happened in the Bible, but is that for today? And all that. I want to tell you that Joel and then, you know, uh, in the book of Acts, uh, with Peter uh, preaching his sermon on the day of Pentecost, he said that in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. And what does it go on to say? Sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. It wasn't just for back then on the day of Pentecost. He said in the last days is what's going to happen. In an increased way. Just imagine, when Jesus came the first time, did anybody have dreams, visions, angelic encounters? Did anybody? Yes, Joseph, Mary, Zacharias. You go on and on and on. People were, were, were hearing from God. He was encountering them in, in supernatural ways before Jesus came on the scene. You don't think He's going to do that before He comes on the scene again? Of course He is. And even greater measure, He's going to do that before His second coming. That's the great thing about God and why He's such a great teacher and a great author is because He gives us little foreshadowings, little pictures. He brings things full circle. He's the greatest storyteller there ever was. And He wants us to be a part of the story and that's why He lays it out for us. He gives us this whole uh, woven thing throughout His Word. He gives us this storyline. And we get to connect to it in a real way. So that's why we're talking about this today. Does that make sense? So I know some of you probably don't have your outline from the last time we were going to do this like a month ago or whatever it was, but that's okay. I mean, we can make some copies. You can take your own notes or whatever it is, but we're going to go through this as quickly as we can, and we'll see what God wants to do. But it, let me back up. What I started out saying was that tonight, if you want to come and if you've got something to share, we're, we're going to open up the floor for that. Like I said, if God has been speaking to you. Uh, I'm just giving you some vision about where He wants to take things. Whatever God may be sharing with your heart about some things that He may want to do. And just to encourage us. That's the whole thing. The, the prophecy is to edify and to encourage the body. That's what it's for. So we want to hear if God has shown you something, has spoken to you, release it, man. And we'll say yes. And we'll partner and say, let's go for it. Okay? So tonight, like I said, we're going to just worship and pray, and then we're just going to allow just kind of some open forum for, for hearts to just share. And so it's going to be good, I believe. So you want to come tonight and come here a little bit early at 545 so you can be a witness to the baptism, and then we'll see what's going to happen. Sound good to everybody? Yeah. All right, good. All right, so let me just open up a couple things here. Proverbs 29, 18, okay? This is why this, this topic is, is essential, even though it's something that we sort of relegate to the hyper-spiritual or to the prophets, or once again, it happened in the Bible and it's not for us or whatever it is. But it's, it's going to gain, like I said, more and more significance, more and more importance, more and more prominence in the days to come. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no prophetic vision. Think about that. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. The people cast off restraint. Okay? So what happens is, is when you have prophetic vision, when you have direction, when you have clear words from the Lord about what His calling, what His assignment is, what His Spirit is doing in your midst, then you can go toward that. You can tar start to take steps to pursue that, to align your priorities, to align your life, your heart, in that way, in that direction. If you don't have that, we've got so many options. Sometimes we have in America what I would call the paralysis of too many options. We've got so many things going on, so much entertainment, so much food, so much this, so much that, whatever it is. And we've got to have prophetic vision like a laser beam to focus us in. Otherwise, what does it say? The people cast off restraint and they just kind of try to wander around and you could go this direction or that direction. No, we want to go God's direction. Not man's direction. 
Not a religious direction, not what everybody else is doing. What is the Holy Spirit saying to us for this time, for this season, for this year? Does that make sense? Without prophetic vision, people cast off restraint. And that's the thing about hope. That's the thing about vision. It plumb lines you, man. It centers you. Does that make sense? And if we, we don't have time to waste, right, Gary? The time is short. Jesus is coming soon. We have got to get ourselves focused in. Whatever that means, whatever extra baggage, whatever, whatever. Whatever things we got to let go of, it's time to let go. And trust me, what God wants to do is going to take you far beyond whatever you're clinging to, whatever things are, 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 are dazzling you right now. Jesus is the beautiful one, and He's got a beautiful plan for our lives and for the future, okay? And let's tap into that as much as we can. Let's don't say, well, I'll just take a, a little piece, and I'll just kind of survive. No, let's say, I want the fullness of my destiny in Jesus Christ. I'm going to press it. I'm going to reach for it. And I may only get to 50, 60, 70, 80%, but I'm, I'm going for it. I might fail, I might stumble, but I'm going to get back up, and I'm going to press back in. Because I have a prophetic vision. And I'm not going to allow anything else to get me busy or distracted from that. Okay? So that's huge. Proverbs 29, 18 is absolutely huge. Okay, so I just wanted to begin with that. Now here's the thing. Now you might, you might say to yourself, well, if we're in the last days and the Holy Spirit's pouring out and people are receiving dreams and it's a biblical idea, why then are dreams and visions maybe hindered? Or why are they minimal? Okay? Because there is a time... In the history of God's people with Israel, that there was no prophetic voice and there was no prophetic word. I'm talking about for hundreds and hundreds of years. There was silence in the land before John the Baptist came on the scene as the voice, the forerunner, crying out in the wilderness. Okay? So why was that the case? Why was there such a, a, a barrenness in the land when it came to hearing the Lord's voice? Well, if you look back at some of it, we can, we can find some evidence of what's going on. In 1 Samuel 3, verse 1, okay? Now the boy Samuel, listen, was ministering to the Lord. And we know Samuel, right? He was dedicated by his mother. She couldn't uh, get pregnant. And she cries out to the Lord, you know, for a child. And he answers her cry. And she said, if you'll give me a child, I'll dedicate him to you forever. And she did. She made good on her word. And she dedicated Samuel to the temple. And he's in there with Eli and his sons. But let me tell you, Eli did not shepherd his sons. He did not father them well at all. And that was a problem. That God had his hand on Samuel and was able to, to cover him and keep him uh, kind of away from that influence. But here's the thing. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord, listen, the word of the Lord was rare in those days and there was no frequent vision. Okay, think about it. There was no frequent vision. And we're going to talk about why that is here in just a second. First Samuel 28, 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, you guys know Saul, right? Trying to kill David, all this jealousy, all this disobedience that he had. He cared about the people and his reputation more than he did about the presence of God, etc., etc. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him. This was a situation, you know, of course, we know that he's trying to do some divination. He's entering into witchcraft. He's doing all these things outside of God's will and God's way. It says the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Think about that. So in both of these contexts here, in Samuel, there was, no, there was no vision, there was no dreams. He didn't answer by prophets. So what's going on here, okay? So number one is this, is that the priesthood, the prophets, the people of God, the leadership, why are, they, are the dreams and visions minimal or are hindered? It's because they're not seeking God or they're not in right alignment or in their proper functioning. Think about that. That's what's going on with Eli and his sons. You can read through and see the whole storyline. But they're, they're abusing their power and their position. They're not treating the, the, the temple and all the sacrifices as holy. They're eating the food. They're doing all these different things. Just taking it lightly. Supposed to be serving the Lord. And the Lord says, if that's how you're going to treat my house, if that's what you're, how you're going to treat my name, if that's how you're going to worship me, i got nothing to do with that. You're on your own. Go ahead and beseech me and pray and do your sacrifices and all. But the dreams and the visions and the, me speaking to the prophets is going to stop until you get your heart right. You're out of alignment. You're disobeying me. You're not in your proper function. You've got a particular identity. You've got a particular role. But you're completely out of whack. You're not obeying me at all. You're not submitting to me. That's why there was a lack. There were, the dreams and visions were minimal or hindered. 
And of course, we see with Saul, it's just disobedience. Disobedience to the Lord's will. Especially if there's a pattern of it. If there's a pattern of disobedience, what's going to happen is your flesh is going to be more and more magnified and the Spirit of God is going to fade and fade and fade away. That's what's going to happen. Your heart's going to get more and more hard and less sensitive. That's just the, that's just the nature of what happens. Whatever you feed yourself, you're either going to feed the flesh or you're going to feed the Spirit. And that's how you're going to filter everything through that. Based on you and your obedience or disobedience. And that's what's going on with Saul. As he gets more and more numb, more and more hard, more and more against the will of God. And oftentimes people, they, don't, they can't even see the difference. Sometimes people still think they're doing the will of God. In their own stubbornness and their own rebellion. Thinking that I'm right. They've got all this pride and they've got all this whatever that's in them. Because you think about Saul, you think about Paul, you think about these different ones. They thought that they were doing what was right. Oftentimes, didn't they? Because they had gotten that blinded. They would gotten that prideful. They could just go through the routine. They knew, they knew some of how things were supposed to go, right? So they could kind of go through the motions a bit, which is what Saul did all the time. Remember what he said to Samuel? Just go out with me in front of the people. Right? To show that God is still in this thing. I don't want to be embarrassed. Right? That was the thing. Just come out with me and just say a little something. It'll be okay. Dangerous place to be. When you're putting yourself and your reputation above obedience to Almighty God. You're trying to cover up. <laughs> Dangerous. And so when that happens, guess what? The Spirit of the Lord. You're not going to be able to hear from Him. Okay? You're out of alignment. So that's the thing. So here's, and once again, I've said this before, but the reality is this. God is cleaning His house. God is purifying His bride. God is putting things in order. God is opening our eyes, giving us a fresh wind in ourselves to say, hey, though the darkness is coming, though all of these things are, are coming, I am going to pour out. I'm going to be with you until the end. I am going to glorify my name. I'm going to use you in a powerful way. I'm not going to abandon you. When it's the darkest is when I want you to shine the brightest. It's the great and terrible day of the Lord. I want you as forerunners to be my voice to prepare the way. And so to help you prepare the way, I am going to give you dreams and visions. I'm going to give you clear instruction. I'm going to give you strategies from heaven. That's the thing. To confirm it, to give you confidence for that hope and that faith to arise within you. And we're going to talk about that. You think about, think about just real quick. You think about Peter, right? You think about that whole situation where he had the vision, right? When he was going to have to go to this Gentile named Cornelius, who, and he had had a vision. You remember that? He had had a vision. And so this whole situation unfolds. I guess it was Paul. I said Peter, but he has this vision, right, of this... This, uh, this whole blanket coming down with all these animals, right? All these unclean things on them. And he's saying, I want you to get up and, and take a knee. And he's like, no, I can't do that, Lord. I'd far be it for me to, to defile myself that way. Three different times he had the vision. And what was he doing during this time when he had the vision? He was praying and meditating and fasting. Okay. And so he has this vision three. Why? Does, why? Because he kept on saying, what's going on here? Lord, I, this is, you know this is not right. I can't, this can't be from you. What's going on? Because what was about to happen were, were, was the Gentiles were about to receive the gospel. All right? A major breakthrough was going to happen that, that, that God was about to bring in another fold of the sheep. It wasn't just for Israel. It was going to go to all the world. And the Jews were not used to this. The Jews had their own system, their own thing going on. And all of a sudden, God's about to shift history. He's about to transform things forever in a major way. And so for him to be able to get that and to, and to have enough unction and enough courage to actually go and approach this man, he had to have this vision three times happen. Then the guy that's that that uh, the, the soldiers, the servants, whoever that Cornelius sent had to come and say, "Hey, our master had a, had a dream that you were going to come and you were going to speak." And then he was like, "Whoa, you know what? This is God. I'm going with you." Otherwise, he never would have went with them. He wouldn't have. 
all his religious tradition and all the knowledge that he had and all the history that he had, if not for that vision, if not for the Spirit of God giving him a vision and giving another man a vision that came together, the gospel would not have been able to go forth and spread across the world. It started with him having a vision. Does that make sense to you? When God's about to shift things, when God's about to do a move, when God's about to do something big that's that's earth shattering, that's that's monumental in, in its history, he's going to release dreams and visions beforehand. The Bible says that he does nothing except for he speaks to his prophets. Think about that. He does nothing but he speaks to his prophets beforehand. So I'm just giving you a, a little taste here. This is a side issue. I think we've made it a side issue, myself included, because I'm not a big dreamer. I have all the pizza dreams that I can't remember, you know, and wake up like, what was that, you know? Flying around in your underwear, you know, or whatever it is. Uh, I, I get that weird stuff. I'm in the ocean and sharks are surrounding me and I can't swim away, whatever it is. So I'm saying, help me, God. I, give me grace because I know this is how you're going to move even more. It's how you have it. It's how you're going to. God, release dreams and visions. Let me be, let, let, I don't want to be bored or checked out or distant or not functioning properly or not aligned or it being disobedient. If this is how you're going to speak, I want it. Man, I tell you, sometimes dreams can be vivid. Sometimes dreams, man. Have you ever cried? Have you ever wake up just, just shivering or just like your stomach and just or on the floor because you fell out of the bed? I've done that. And I just got through saying I wasn't much of a dreamer, but probably just a few times in my life I've had dreams that were just like, whoa. And some dreams that I had that, that, that was a foreshadowing of something major that was about to happen in my life. Like with my grandparents and different things before she died. I, I don't want to go into that, but I'm just saying. That's real. And if you've ever experienced that, something marks you on that. You can't get away from that. That dream starts to haunt you. Hello. Has anybody ever experienced this or is it just me? Yeah, man. Haunt me, Holy Ghost. Haunt me, Holy Ghost. With dreams. You can't get that out of your mind. Something's ingrained in you then. You hear what I'm saying? We need to be marked with dreams. Can't escape from them. He's haunting us with them. As crazy as that? I'm crazy. I guess I'm just crazy. That's okay. But watch what God will do with crazy. <laughs> The reality is this, that God does speak through these means, and He will do so in an increased measure before Jesus returns. It will be, listen, it will be a primary way that He prepares His people and the earth for what is coming. It will be a primary way. We've got to get our, our thinking shifted. This is not a secondary issue. Okay, let's go on quickly. I already, let me just say this. That, that, that scripture that I said a minute ago, Amos 3, 7, is what it is. For the Lord God does nothing without revealing His secret. See, God wants to give the... We're not just slaves, okay? Jesus said, no longer do I call you my servants or slaves, but I call you my friends. Why? Because I've revealed the Father's heart to you. And I want to reveal more of His secrets to you. Because you're my friends and we're intimate like that. I love you that much that I want to tell you things that are dear to my heart. That's who our God is. He wants to draw us near and share things that are dear to His heart. Even His very secrets. The Lord God does nothing without revealing His secret to His servants, the prophets. So we don't get to say, well, I guess, you know, God just kind of left His hind dry. God's not speaking. No, I'm sorry. It says He doesn't do anything. But He speaks and reveals His secrets to His servants. We already, we already looked at Acts 2.17. That's the dreams. Uh, old men dream your dreams and young men see the same visions. All right, so now that we've got all that set up, let's go quickly. The, so let's, there's a couple scriptures here that really narrow down the overarching ways that God uses dreams, okay? So let's, let, me, let me read the scriptures, okay? Job 33, okay? Verse 14 through 18. For God speaks in one way, listen to this, and in two. Though man does not perceive it, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men while they slumber on their beds... Then he opens the ears of men. Sometimes you just need to be asleep with your bad self. Just shut up and go to sleep so that God can open the ears that you have. You just need to shut down. Stop with all your stuff for a second. It's just junk anyway. 
<laughs> and some of you need some deep sleep, man, because that's why you're going crazy. Because you're not sleeping. You're not getting rest. And God will awaken you in the night. Don't get me wrong. If God awakens you in the night, you know, get up. That's fine. Get some milk, whatever you got to do. It's okay. When deep sleep falls on men while they slumber in their beds, then he opens the ears of men, listen to this, and terrifies them. Oh, I'm going to have a deep sleep. Thank you, Jesus. You're a good shepherd. Oh, terrified with warnings that he may turn aside from his deed and conceal, listen, conceal pride from a man. That's the thing. He doesn't want you to get confused and think that this is your idea. Hello? He wants to deal with your pride. I'm going to rock your world in the dream world, okay, in the spirit realm, and reveal some terrifying things to you so that you humble yourself and pay attention. It's a warning. Hello? He keeps back his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. I'm going to tell you, man, dreams can be life-saving. That's what it's really saying here. Dreams can literally be life-saving. So the other scripture is this real quick. It's in Daniel 2.28. It says, But there is a God in heaven ha, who reveals mysteries. And He has made known to you, King Nebuchadnezzar, what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions in your head as you lay in bed are these. And then He goes and interprets His dreams and His visions. So with these two scriptures then, what are the overarching ways that God uses dreams? Number one, I already said it, to deal with the pride of men, to cause them to fear the Lord in order that they would heed or pay attention to a warning of destruction or a warning of whatever might happen. Judgment, some futuristic thing, whatever it is. The overarching ways most of the time is he's trying to deal with our pride and trying to get us to fear him. Like I said, sometimes dreams, man, they're going to mark you in a particular way and cause you to tremble. And it's okay. It's okay. We need that tremble in our spirit. We need that tremble before the word of the Lord. To fear the Lord is clean, the Bible says, and endures forever. Fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, etc., etc., right? God, deal with our pride and cause us to fear you so that we would heed and pay attention to what you're doing. That's what dreams, the overarching way that God uses them. And then, of course, he, to, to reveal mysteries is what it said in Daniel. God wants to reveal mysteries. And not only that, but he's revealing mysteries not just to say, hey, wasn't that cool? You know, hey, go write a song about that. Hey, make a painting about that or share that with your church. It's because he wants to actually shape history in nations through revealing his mysteries. And that's what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. He gave Daniel a huge prophetic vision about what was going to happen with Babylon and blah, 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 blah. Even beyond Babylon and to before Jesus returns. It was through a dream and a vision from a king who actually was not the best king. <laughs> but even God in his mercy will try to get to that wicked king and say, I'm going to terrify you in the night. And I'm going to send you someone who's going to interpret that dream. And you're going to have to decide what you're going to do with that. Because I'm going to break down your kingdom. And that's what happened. He said, I'm going to show the progression of how your kingdom is going to break down and be split off into all these different ways because of your rebellion and disobedience. Even God would reach out to a king like that and tell him what was about to happen. If God would do it for Nebuchadnezzar, how many of you know he's going to do it for his sons and daughters that are after his heart? Reveal mysteries to shape us and to shape nations and to shape history. Hello. We're not talking about Justin's pizza dreams anymore. We're talking about something much bigger than that. And it's exciting to me. I don't know if you guys are excited or not, but I'm excited. All right, so now real quick, we're going to run through this. All right, so those are the overarching things. But then we can see the purposes of dreams kind of more in individual lives as we see some of the stories throughout the Bible, okay? And there are many of them. I'm only giving you a few that make some, some particular solid points, but there are many other stories beyond this, but these are just a few. Okay, so there's a, there's a guy named Abimelech, okay? You can find this story if you want to look at it later in Genesis chapter 20, verse 1 through 7. So what happens is, is Abraham comes into this particular uh, part of the country. His wife, Sarah, is beautiful, whatever. Abimelech is there, and he's worried that, oh, man, he's going to take over. He's going he's gonna, to whatever. And so I'm going to offer him my wife and just say, it's, it's not my wife, it's my sister. 
which apparently that was a half-truth, it was his half-sister, or whatever it was. So I guess he thought it was okay to try to manipulate the situation to get himself out of trouble or potential danger or whatever it was. So Abimelech takes Sarah into his courts and into his chamber, whatever, into the, into the palace. And guess what happens? God visits Abimelech in a dream and says, Hey, brother, don't, don't do this. This is not good. This is actually Abraham's wife. Think about that. This is the situation that happens here, okay? And so he's like, I'm not touching this woman because the God of heaven terrified me in a dream, and I know if I, if I do anything with this, there's going to be major consequences. So I'm to returning her to you. Why did you lie to me, Abraham? Right? That's what happens. So here's what happens with the, with the dream then. So the dream, here's what dreams can do. The purposes of dreams. The dreams can expose deception and reveal truth. Because let me tell you, there are people, not just outside of the church, but within the church, that are wolves in sheep's clothing. The Bible talks about how false teachers and false prophets and people that want to divide and cause strife and that have a bitter root will come into your midst. It says that. And God said, I want to reveal to you that this person, there's some deception, there's something there that you need to deal with. Now, He wants to do it in a redeeming way. I'm not saying that we get hypercritical and look at everybody as though they're, you know, the boogeyman. But you hear what I'm saying. God wants us to deal with that, that, that divisiveness and that deception and that strife before it starts to cause damage with the rest of the body. Does that make sense? And we have to be discerning shepherds and take care of that. And oftentimes God will do it with a dream. The dream could involve all kinds of different things. And I'm sure you guys have had dreams like that where God gives you a warning about there's a particular deception or manipulation that's happening. So God will give a warning that sin is about to be committed, which could have major consequences. It's your job to get in there and prevent this from happening. And also the dream. So then obviously the dream brought protection and brought restoration to Sarah. Okay? Think about her having to be given up by her husband into this, to this king. I mean, what, what was going through her mind? How scared I, you know, must she have been? Wondering, like, how is this happening, God? This is crazy. Why would you treat me like this? We're traveling. We're trying to get to this land that you promised us. You said we were going to have, you know, descendants that are as many as the stars in the sky. And now here I am trapped with this king who wants to do God knows what to me. But God brought her out of that, protected her, and brought restoration, obviously, so that she could come back with Abraham and they could continue on with God's prophetic promise that they would have a son, et cetera, et cetera, continue on their journey. Does that make sense? We're all on a journey, man, and we need to be protected. We need to know how we navigate certain people in certain situations. God wants to protect us, and oftentimes He'll give us a dream to do that and show us the way out of that situation. Hello. All right, so then you move on, all right? Real quickly, like I said, we're going to be quick. So then we have the story with Jacob. Remember, Jacob has multiple dreams, and how many of you know that even Jacob, his name means deceiver, supplanter. Right? The guy that stole his brother's birthright, deceived his father. And God reveals himself in dreams to Jacob. Because there was still a promise that God had made to Abraham. And if Jacob would repent, if Jacob would get himself right, and so God encounters him in a dream, and guess what? Jacob did respond. Jacob did repent. Jacob did get himself in alignment with God. So this story is found in Genesis chapter 28, verse 10 through 17. Okay? And we know the situation where he, he grabs a rock for a pillow. I mean, you want to talk about a guy that's desperate to get some sleep. I'll take it a rock for a pillow. And he dreams of this, this ladder reaching up to heaven, right? And angels ascending and descending, right? Major, major dream, actually. And we'll touch on that here in just a minute. So here's Jacob, right? His, with his mother's help, he stole Esau's firstborn inheritance. He fled from his brother Esau because his, obviously his brother was upset about this. And uh, so he's on this journey. He has this dream of the ladder, right? Jacob's ladder. And he receives this promise that, listen, the, 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 the promise I made to your father, that blessing, that still remains. It's still going to be carried on through you. I'm, I'm, I'm still the God that's in control. And I'm showing you my activity. I'm showing you my angels are still moving on your behalf. That was the thing. That was the message. So here's the thing. So here's what the dream can do then. The dream comforted Jacob because Jacob was in turmoil. 
Jacob had left everything. He knew he had betrayed his family. His brother was after him. He didn't know where he was going to go. He didn't know how he was going to survive. The dream comforted Jacob by showing him that God in his mercy was not going to abandon him or his own promise. And it gave him courage. It didn't just comfort him. It gave him courage and resolve. How many of you know we need courage and we need resolve in the hour in which we live? We need holy boldness to come on us. We're only in the beginning of the beginning of the oppression and the persecution that's going to come. We have an experience that other nations have, but it's going to come to the United States. Make no mistake. It gave him courage and resolve to continue on the journey and to trust that God was going to work in the midst of all the brokenness. And also, get this, so it wasn't just that, it's actually bigger than that. How many of you know that oftentimes when God speaks, it's for you, but it's bigger than just for you, it's for other people. Yes. <laughs> the God of abundance, the God of overflow. So here's the thing. The dream was actually a foreshadowing. And it would ultimately bring confirmation to who Jesus was, to Jesus' identity as the dream-giving God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who was going to perform many signs and wonders and miracles. He was the ladder that was reaching from heaven down to earth. Remember that? Yes. Remember that whole scenario where they come to him and he says, Oh, you think this is a great thing that I called you out when you were underneath the fig tree? He said, I tell you, you're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He was referring back to Jacob's dream. You're going to see angels ascending and descending. You're going to see signs and wonders. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the flesh with you right now. I'm the fulfillment of those prophetic words and promises and dreams right now. The dream was a foreshadowing. How would you like to be Jacob? <laughs> and say, I'm the one that had that dream. <laughs> That ladder is named after me. That's Jacob's ladder. Huh, not Justin's ladder. Not Chris's ladder. Not Robert's ladder. That's Jacob's ladder. Man. You know, the Bible says in the book of Revelation that he's going to give us a name that no one else is just special between us and him. He's going to give us a white stone. <laughs> There's rewards in the Bible that will blow your mind, man. He can have Jacob's ladder. I'm going to get Jacob's sledgehammer or something. Justin's whatever. I'm just saying. Let's believe, man. That's what God has reserved for us. For real. If we're faithful to believe and to dream the dreams of God. I mean, you know, right? That's sort of the promise of America. In a sense, the American dream has become twisted and perverted, but... Dream it, man. If you build it, if you build it, Jesus will come. All right? That's what I'm talking about. Build a house of prayer. He will come. Oh, man. Oh, Got to move forward. So, Solomon. Think about this with Solomon, all right? Solomon, you can look at this in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. It was in a dream. What, what, what was the thing... That's the one thing that Solomon asked for. He asked for wisdom. But why would he even think to do that? Because God encountered him in a dream. Did you know that? It was in a dream that God gave Solomon the offer. What was the offer? Ask me whatever you want and I'll give it to you. It was in a dream. And Solomon... So think about that for a second. What do dreams do then in this context? Dreams reveal God's desire. God's desire to do what? To pour out a blessing and to give us the desires of our heart. Of course, if our heart is in alignment with His, it's ultimately the desires of His heart. But you want the desires of His heart more than your heart. Trust me on that. So God reveals His own desire. And then what it is, is He gives Solomon an opportunity to respond to that desire. God wants to reveal to you what's burning on His heart for your life. Hey, I've got all this in store. How are you going to respond? And Solomon says, one thing I want is this wisdom. Give me wisdom. Maybe he looked at, maybe he looked at his dad's life, Gary, and said, you know what? I need to be more wise than David was. Because that dude got jacked up. As awesome as David was and whatever else, but his whole family exploded at some point. 
And Solomon was like, I want to be wiser than my dad. And that's okay to say that. You should be wiser than your dad. You should learn from history. And that's the thing, right? If we don't actually take the lessons from history and the things that have come before us or whatever else, it'll simply just dilute the lessons that we're supposed to be learning today. <laughs> and I'm telling you, this is the history of how God uses dreams. He wants to give you an opportunity to respond to His desire. And God's got, like I said, He's got many dreams and desires. Just think about it. He's about to come. He's about to split the skies and come and rule and reign as king forever. You don't think he's got some dreams and desires and things that he wants to accomplish and progressively get to that point? Of course he does. That's burning in him. And we have the Spirit of God to be able to, to understand these spiritual things, to have these encounters and opportunities with him. So Solomon got an opportunity to respond to God in prayer, to petition the Lord, and to set, listen, to set the priority and the course of his life. That's why, that's, that's what that's what the whole thing is. That's why when you're a kid and you dream and you're you're trying to figure out who you are and what you want to do, and different influences and different experiences that you have, that is shaping you and setting the course for your life. What is the priority? What is the dream that's in your heart? Solomon got a chance to encounter God and say, this is the course that I'm setting for my life. Let me know you. Let me be wise in your eyes, God. Let me fear you. At the end of the day, what did Solomon say at the very end of Ecclesiastes? Everything is vanity. It's all chasing the wind. There's nothing new under the sun. The only thing that I've found, because everybody can toil and store up treasures and all that, and it means nothing. It all vanishes and passes away. He said, the one thing I've found is to fear God and to obey His commands. Bottom line. It set the course of his life. He had a dream and he responded to it. Is anybody okay? Is everybody is anybody getting something? Yes. So this is just the Old Testament. <laughs> we haven't even got into the New Testament except for I jumped ahead and kind of did with the whole thing with the food. I mean the birds or whatever it was. Unclean animals or whatever, right? Which is interesting because God's response. Remember God's response? Whenever he says, God, I'm not, I can't do that. This is unclean. These are uncommon. It will defile. I'm not going to do that. And what does God say? He says, don't call uncommon or unclean what I have made clean or what I have made holy. He was talking about his blood being spilled out for the entire world. He was talking about the Gentiles. I'm going to make them clean. The same way that I've come to you and you guys have done the Day of Atonement and have had to shed blood in order for your sins to be removed. My son has done that for another people besides the Jews. It's called the Gentiles. That means everybody else in the world. That's you and me. Yes. Don't call that common. Don't call my son's blood and the cross common. That's how he responds. And he's like, whoa. Changed everything. Anyway, sorry about that. But you go and you look, right? You go and you look at the first coming of Christ. Like I said, you, you already know that Zacharias had the encounter, right? When he's in the temple with the angel Gabriel and this whole thing comes about his own son and, and, and how he's going to prepare the way for, for Christ. And he comes out of that thing. <laughs> You're talk about dealing with somebody's pride. He comes out, he can't even talk anymore. He just had this huge vision. Everybody's like, what happened? He had an encounter. Tell us what happened. Mm. <laughs> he got stripped of his pride real quick. <laughs> Zacharias. And then finally, when his son is born, and he has to write down for his wife, because she's saying, well, he's going to be named John. Everybody's like, there's nobody in your family named John. Why are you doing that? And he's like, wait a minute, let me back up my wife here. Yeah, we're going to call him John. And then boom, his mouth was open. And he begins to prophesy about John and about Jesus in that moment. So there was a time where he had to just kind of take that in, digest it, wait on God. And then when, the, when his son was born, when that new thing was birthed, boom, he was released to speak the prophetic word of the Lord. Hello. Sometimes you'll sit and meditate and carry that dream with you for a long, long time. 
until the appointed time, God says, now, release. Don't let go of that dream. Don't let go of that vision. Don't let go of what God spoke. There will come a time for it to be released. Amen? Amen. I mean, you go on down the line. You, I, mean, you, I mean, once again, God, in His mercy, here's the guy who's the governor who decides, I really don't want to crucify him because it looks bad, but I'm trying to appease you guys, so I'll just have the guy beat to, to, to a pulp. And then I'll bring him out in front of the people with this robe and this crown of thorns. And I'll say, what do you want me to do with him? I can release one guy on this day. I can release him, your king, the king of the Jews. Or I can release this murderer to you. Which one do you want to have? And God in His mercy, guess what He does? He speaks Pilate's to God. He, he, he stares Jesus in the face and interrogates Him about what is truth and all of this. And Jesus said, those who are on the side of truth listen to my voice. For this purpose I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. And Pilate's response is, what is truth? In a sarcastic tone of voice. Don't you know I have power over you to either release you or crucify you? And Jesus said, you have no power over me except for what's been given to you from heaven. But in God's mercy, in God's compassion, in God's kindness, he encounters Pilate's wife in a dream. She has a terrifying dream, and it's a warning. Basically says, you need to have nothing to do with this man, Jesus. Cut him loose. And she goes to him, right? She goes to Pilate and says, you got to. I, I had a dream. No, do not have nothing to do with this man. He couldn't do it, could he? His pride and his position. I'm the governor of this precinct. I'll show you. God tried because God's that good and He's that merciful even with the wicked. I'm just saying, man. I mean, we can go on and on and on. Yeah. What happened with Paul on the Damascus Road? <laughs> Was that not a major event? Is that not a major person that God mightily used? The light came and blinded him. He fell to his knees. He heard the voice. Why are you persecuting me? What is the first thing out of his mouth? Lord. <laughs> Lord? Lordy, Lordy, you better, yeah. Lord. You just sent a blinding light that threw me off my horse onto my knees and now I'm hearing this voice pierce my soul, Lord. It was interesting. Because evidently the soldiers saw the light, but they didn't hear the voice. Well, they Paul heard the voice. And so he's blinded for three days. And so what has to happen is another guy. Isn't it interesting that God will connect things and major events and people and partnership or whatever with dreams between different people, different groups. And say, yes, this is what I'm fitting together. This is what I want to do. I'm, part, I'm wanting to bring you guys together in this way. So he has to give a dream to Ananias to say, hey, I need you to go. I need you to pray for this guy named Saul. And he's like, whoa, who? No, that, that's, this is of the devil. This is not the Lord. Don't you know who this guy is and what he's been doing? I can't know. Well, once again, the dream, the vision, it, it was the only thing that he could cling to to say, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try. You know, whatever. Hope this guy doesn't kill me. But I'm sure that as, as it got closer, I'm sure he, he got wind of the fact that Saul had had an encounter and was blind, right? He goes and he prays, and uh, Paul gets baptized, and when he comes up out of the water, the scales fall from his eyes. Man, I bet Ananias was eating his words then, wasn't he? <laughs> you know what God said to Ananias about that, about, about, about Paul? He said, I want you to go to him and tell him how much he's going to have to suffer for my name's sake. So God, here's this guy who's persecuting your people and dragging them out of their homes and murdering them and throwing them into prison. And you want me to tell him how much he's going to have to suffer for you? <laughs> wow. That's a, it's no problem. Easy message. Thank you. All right. Thanks for choosing me. <laughs> and Paul would find out, wouldn't he, how much he was going to suffer for the name of Jesus. But he counted it all joy. 
Thank you for counting me worthy, Lord, to suffer for your name, to carry the gospel. He would even say, I carry the brand marks of Christ on my body. He'd been beaten many times. You know what happens when you get beaten with the rods that they had back then? You get, you get bruises on your bones. That's what happens. Have you, ever, have you ever been so bruised that it went to your bone? Maybe you have. That is not a pleasant experience at all. Paul had this multiple times. In prison multiple times. But guess what? He saw a light and he heard a voice and another man had a vision and a dream and came and scales fell from his eyes. And not only that, but he had other visions and dreams, did he not? There was a time when he was supposed to go to Macedonia and he had a dream and said, don't go there. I want you to go here. Stay here for a little bit instead. Remember that? There was direction for Paul on his journey. He was just going to preach the gospel. And he, in his zeal, he was ready to go everywhere. And the Holy Spirit said, oh, not yet, son. I know, you're, I know you're happy and excited. Don't do it. Dream and a vision. Boom. Okay. I want to have that type of clarity. I want to have that type of leadership in my life from God. Hello. Now, I'm certainly not there. But I, uh, okay. Now, this is the last thing. Well, not the last thing I'll say, but close. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> now, John, right? John the Revelator. What was what's the whole book of Revelation based on? <laughs> A vision that he was caught up to the heavenlies. <laughs> and he guess where he was at? He was exiled to the Isle of Patmos for decades and decades. Probably just forced labor, lonely, isolated, not knowing what's going on in the church or in the world. And the Bible says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He had not given up on the dream and the vision of God, even after being exiled to Patmos for all those years. Who was he? He was called John the Beloved. He was the one that linked his head onto Jesus' chest. He still maintained that intimacy and that trust. And God said, you know what, John? Come up here. <laughs> I'm about to show you something. I know you've been down there. Come up here. Come on, somebody. Whatever, whatever, whatever is going on, whatever journey you've been on, whatever island you feel like you've been on, stay the course. God's going to call you up. He's going to call you up. So let's just get a, a really big list and just cover some of the things maybe that I didn't cover. So what do dreams do? Once again, they can warn a person not to do something or to do something. They can convey what would happen either in the near or the distant future. They can convey a spiritual truth. They can confirm a promise. They can offer encouragement. They can inform someone or a group to do something. They can convey to an enemy their destruction. They can offer a person a gift from God. Dreams can warn a person that they're about to receive punishment or consequences if they continue down a particular path. So, do you guys have uh, some more respect for dreams and visions now? I hope so. Now, just real quick, all right, we think about, when you think about dreamers, who are the two guys that you think about? We haven't even mentioned this one guy's name yet. Say it louder. There you go. Come on, Kaylin. She's got coats of many colors. She knows what's up. She's fashionable in the house. Joseph. You think about Joseph. <laughs> what was his life like? He would not have been able to sustain the betrayal, the slavery, all the junk, the imprisonment, if not for that original dream that God had gave him in the beginning. But he clung to that dream. And it wasn't about, it wasn't about I'm going to be a big shot and my brothers are going to bow before me. What was it about in the end? Here they are bowing before me because they're starving to death. And I've been put in a position by God Himself to be able to feed them. And instead of pointing His finger and saying, you're getting what you deserve, He embraces them and forgives them and says, what the enemy meant for evil, God has turned for good. And restoration and redemption were able to happen. Why? Because he didn't let go of the dream in God's heart. And he didn't try to pervert it. He didn't try to use it for his own gain. He 
He used it for God's glory and God's purposes. He could have. He could have said, you guys, it's over with. You guys are executed. See ya. That's what you get. Your sins found you out. And now it's over with. He could have done that. He had all the power in the world to do that. He could have sent them back empty handed and said, try again next year. Maybe I'll have mercy on you. You know what? You can be my slaves for the next year. Right? Or whatever. Aaron, that's what I probably would have done. Hey, man, I need a cup bear. I need my lawn mowed. You know, I some big things. You can help me out. And then you can buy back some trust and it'll be good. Not Joseph. And, and here's the thing about Joseph. He's this one man who kept his heart pure and clung to the dream of God. And he saved an entire people group. <laughs> he, he shifted history. He, he got to, to one of the most... Antichrist, demonic, religious. I mean, if you think about Egypt, you think about how many gods and how much, what false religion there was, and he got to be the man right underneath him. But that sort of trust and influence, and that went on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Remember, the Egypt, the Egyptians continued to treat Israel with respect and to have a partnership until a Pharaoh came along. The Bible says, who did not remember Joseph. And then everything changed. Because that Pharaoh said, you Israelites are too big, you're too blessed. Something's going on here. They got jealous, they got afraid, and they enslaved them. Forgot about Joseph, the dreamer. And they got off track. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. God wants to shift things with dreams and visions. Yes. And of course, you think, about, you think about Daniel. So you think about Joseph, and number two, you think about Daniel. And when did he receive his biggest revelation? When he was fasting and praying for 21 days straight. So you might think, well, my fasting doesn't really matter, or I don't know, and this and that. Listen, it matters. And it does add up. It does do something in your heart, in your spirit. It doesn't twist the arm of God. It simply tenderizes you. It simply positions you. So don't take lightly your prayer and your fasting because that's where God wants to release His mysteries and His secrets. And of course, we know Daniel got a huge revelation that has been played out in history. We've seen it actually happen for real. It's already happened. So we know that the things that he, when he talked about the future, those are also going to happen because he's proven that it's already happened. And I believe God is wanting to give us that type of the revelation. I believe, because here's the thing that is said, Edgar, in the book of Daniel, there was a part of it that he said, this part you need to seal up and put away until a future time. I believe we're getting close to that time where the things that were sealed up for Daniel will be unlocked for us. Hear me now. Think about that. There were things that were sealed up and God still is yet to release. So there's Daniels, there's Josephs, there's dreamers in this room. Could you be the one? Could we be the church? Could we be the body? Could we? I don't know. It's going to be multiple things. I'm sure God's going to confirm it all over. I'm not. So we're not. I'm not trying to get a big head about this. But I am saying, let's go for it. Let's believe it. Let's desire it. Because God has done it before. Guess what? God wants to do it again. So here's the last thing, all right, that I'll say. Because these guys wielded great influence in their culture. All right, think about that. Joseph and Daniel had so much influence in their culture. It affected kings. It affected the government. It affected what happened in the entire nation. Do we need some, 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 some leaders to be shifted? Do we need them to see some truth? Do we need them to repent? Do we need them to encounter God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Yes. And He wants to use people to do it. Dreams and visions to do it. God is wanting His bride to join in His desire and the fellowship of His heart to join Him in His dream. You heard me say this before. When you lose yourself in His dream, He'll take care of your dreams. The question for us is, do we want to see the fullness of His dream manifested in our generation? Yes. Do we want to see it? Yes. 
How bad do we want it? Are we going to position ourselves? Are we going to go after this thing? I, I believe so. I believe we're, we're in the beginning stages of, of setting our hearts and getting in alignment. And it's good. It's good. All right, amen. Let's stand. And so here's what I want to do. I want to ask the prayer teams to come up. I think the prayer teams are going to be on this side of the room. We're going to leave this side open as the altar for you guys to come if you want to respond to the Lord. But I can't help thinking about this hope, this issue of hope, because that's what dreams do. They, they, they give you hope. You can say, you know what? God gave me that dream. I heard God's voice. I know that He's moving. I know He's working. He's, he's bringing me on a journey towards something. It's not all in vain. It's not all a waste. There's a reason. There's a, there's a purpose. There's, a, there's a, a direction. Maybe some of you feel like you've cast off that restraint and you just kind of wandered and you've given up. On those dreams of God. You've given up on something that maybe years ago God spoke or God did. And maybe it just doesn't hit you in the same way. Maybe you're, you're not in the Word. You're not being moved. To, you know, I don't know what it is. I don't know what sort of wilderness or what sort of season that you're in. But God does. And I have to believe that as we're talking about this, this sort of reawakening of, of the spirit, of the supernatural, of dreams and visions, that, that God is wanting to invite you in. And He wants you to, to have that hope restored, to have that vision renewed today. And it doesn't have to be anything big or major. It could be a small thing. It could be something that you've been crying out for for a really long time. It may be a small thing, but it really matters to you. And guess what? If it matters to you, it matters to Him. Don't let go of that thing. Maybe you just need that fire rekindled. You know, you need to set your face like flint again to say, I'm after you, God. I know you're going to open doors. I just can't see them right now. It seems like all the doors are shut. But you're a God who opens doors that no man can shut. And you shut doors that no man can open. Maybe you need that type of guidance with your job or your family or whatever it is. And I believe that God wants to break in and break through in those ways today. So to, we talked about restoration today. We had a story, a testimony today of what God's doing. In the midst of trying to outrun God and outfigure out things, you know, or whatever. That seed that God has planted in you, it's still there. It's still there. It may be dormant, but He wants to water it. He wants to shine a light on it. He wants it to grow. God wants to use your life. I, you know, I said, I said this to, to Jeremy a while back. We were at a, a thing together, and I said, Hey, man, it's not just about you getting free and you getting clean and you getting renewed, man. That's great, and that's necessary, and you need that. But you need to believe that God wants to use your life. Your life is more than just... Whatever, your past and a, and a momentary thing, your life matters in Christ Jesus. You have a purpose, you have an identity, you have a destiny, and God wants to see you walk in that, man. And you getting delivered is just a part of that journey, but there's more of the journey for you. So we can just get the lights down. and We just want to set ourselves before the Lord just one more time. So if that's you, we got the prayer teams here. we got the altar over here. Just come and respond to the Lord. I'm just going to pray a little bit. I'm going to try to be quiet and not go really long like I sometimes do. I just, I just want to set the atmosphere for a minute and then step back because God is the God who gives dreams and who reveals mysteries, who speaks to our hearts right when we need it the most, right when we're about to give up. I can't tell you how many times... That God has encountered me or brought someone in my path or had a situation pop up when I was just about ready to quit. I was just about ready to turn and do something else. Over and over and over again, He just He won't leave me alone. He won't let me go. And I'm like, God, just I, I don't know why you're doing this. It's just His grace. It's just His goodness. It's just who He is. I can't escape that anymore. So if you're here and you need to run into His arms, please do so. Let's just bow before the Lord. However you need to position yourself. If you need to go, that's fine. You can go. But we just want this to be a house where we're just open to the word of the Lord, to the visions and dreams, to Him restoring us to the full. He wants to restore those dreams and visions. Father, send your Holy Spirit even now. We're just asking. We're desperate for you to come and do what only you can do. The God of all creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We want to set a course for our life like Solomon did, Father. We want the desires of your heart to be made manifest. We want your dreams to be made manifest in our generation. 
We want to be those forerunners. And so, God, prepare us. Give us dreams and visions, God. Shift our thinking. God, you want to shift our leaders. You want to shift this nation. You want to use weak and broken people that are submitted to your will, that have enough faith and trust and intimacy to call out to you even in the night, even when it seems dark. To say, God, awaken my heart. Awaken me in the night. God, speak to your, for your servant is listening. That was the thing. That was the one instruction that Eli gave to Samuel. He said, listen, God's trying to speak to you while you're sleeping. The next time he speaks to you, just say, here I am, your servant. I'm listening. That's what we say today, Lord. Here we are, your servants, your friends, friends of the bridegroom. Reveal your heart. Let it burn within us, God. Help us to reprioritize. Help us to realign. God, we just posture ourselves before you. Before your second coming, you want to pour out your spirit and release dreams and visions that we would prophesy at the appointed time. The mysteries that have been reserved, Father. Could we be the ones, could we be the trusted vessels of honor and humility that would give you all the glory, Father, that would help bring in a harvest, that would co-labor with you, Jesus, to dream your dreams, to see them, Father, happen in real time, in real space. It's just a dream. It's just a dream until we can help walk it out. Oh, everything hangs on a word. Everything hangs in the balance with you, Jesus. You're such a good God. You're such a perfect leader. We trust in your perfect wisdom. Come and lead us, God. Oh, Father, restore vision and restore hope in this place, even now, to the ones that are weary. You said, all who are weary and heavy laden, come to me. I'll give you rest for your souls. Make it clear, God. Make it plain. Write it on the tablet of our heart, God, right now in a personal way. Right now, in a personal way. You are the hope of the earth. You are the hope of our hearts, God. You are the anchor for our souls. Where else can we go? You alone have the words of life. Speak your words of life to us right now. We thank you for it, Father. We go forward.